Thank you very much, Laura. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, so for the, those of you that don't know, um, so Bitter X, which is running this event, um, is a chapter of Bitter. So Bitter is the British Irish Trading Alliance. Uh, it's a non-profit making organization uh, and it encourages its members to uh, build relationships, and generate business and for exciting networking, educational and social events. Um, the Bitter X chapter is uh, dedicated to um, working with young professionals, uh, providing uh, education um, and uh, opportunities um, for, 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 young, for young professionals. And in our later series of uh, webinars um, that we started uh, in, the, uh, in reaction to the lockdown period, um, you know, we welcome our, 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 next, our next speaker, our next guest. And I'm very excited this week to be speaking to uh, Kieran O'Connor. Welcome, Kieran. Thanks very much for having me. And, um, you know, we've been lucky enough over this period of time to be speaking to, you know, some exciting, you know, sort of young entrepreneurs and hear, hearing stories about their business and what it is and their journey so far. Um, and I think, you know, from the conversations, Kieran, that we had, you know, offline ahead of the conversation day, it was it was pretty clear that, you know, there were lots of sort of, you know, values that you held that, you know, we, we were keen to get in front of our, our audience and to share, uh, you know, with the wider, uh, wider bidder X uh, community. Um, so Kieran, just to kick things off, um, what would be really helpful and sort of, I suppose, useful for everyone just to um, just touch on a bit of a background like you, from yourself. Yeah, thanks very much. Again, thanks very much for having me and um, I'm uh, glad to be part of the community. So yeah, give you a, a bit of a background. I won't bore you too much with going all the way back but to give you a bit of a, an intro um, I grew up in a place called Norfolk those of you who don't know it's about two hours from London um, typical kind of upbringing nothing nothing uh, sort of out the ordinary but um, something that, that I guess stands out and people talk about a lot and something that I bring up quite a lot is the the challenges that I faced in a young age suffering with dyslexia throughout the whole time at school um, academically wise uh, I wasn't smart um, in terms of predicted grades and things like that, that I would get at school, it would be very much um, E's, F's and so on. So uh, from a young age, it, you know, wasn't predicted to go on and achieve much according to the, the kind of norm. So um, although now it's a different story, but to kind of go back, it, it certainly wasn't an easy start, nor did I, you know, get an easy start to life. So dyslexia wise, it kind of really spurred me on. And my kind of, what I would call the starting point at the age of 16, um, my kind of final year going into GCSEs is really where I found my confidence and, and kind of come into my own. So a lot of people will hear this, you know, we all get told that, you know, we're not good at things and we're, you know, we get these predicted grades and people put us down. And what I've done quite early on is I didn't let that affect me from the age of 16. So, um, went on and achieved okay grades, you know, C's and B's according to what I was predicted pretty good. And then sort of ended up in sales as a lot of us do, you know, um, a lot of us kind of fall into sales and don't necessarily uh, choose it as a career. At the age of 16, went into insurance sales. Um, as you all know, you've got the go compare and comparison sites. I would then be that person on the phone. My job would be to upsell, cross sell you um, and was number one out of 100 by the age of, of 17. So really, really fast start in my career. Decided not to go to university, which again was a decision because I felt that I was better suited to a proactive learning rather than um, a classroom environment. So from there, I kind of went on to a SaaS based company where I became top performer doing 1.8 million in sales in a year. And then subsequently went to Orlando, Florida um, to build a team out there. So quite a rapid rise um, from sort of um, 16 to 19 to go into Orlando, um, left Orlando and then came back to London, uh, was given the opportunity at the age of just 21 to be a sales manager and lead a, a software company. Um, and then subsequently turned it into the second fastest growing tech company at the time in England, and then went to Austin, Texas and led my own team as a commercial de director, both in Australia, Austin, Texas, uh, and Dubai. So yeah, it was a, a rapid rise from an early, early on, but um, you know, to kind of give a context, it certainly wasn't an easy ride. And um, I know we'll touch on this as we go on, but I want to make it clear, you know, it was very much, a lot of work ethic and uh, a lot of proven doubt was wrong from an early age. So when, when was it you, 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 you founded your company? How, how, how old were you when that was happened? Was that directly after you were in, you were in the States, right? Yeah. So when I founded Grossium, I was age of 22. So literally as I landed from Uruguay, I actually went from Austin to Uruguay and decided that I had this business idea and I wanted to help more companies. And within 24 hours, I'd landed in the UK and uh, subsequently set the company up uh, back in September, 2018. 
Okay, great. And in terms of how you expect, I mean, how the last couple of years have been um, and going through that process of, um, you know, starting the business, I mean, you know, what was sort of going on, what was sort of going on in your mind of, of the challenge that you'd have ahead and how's that contrasted to probably the challenge that you've actually had to experience? Yeah, so, you know, owning and running your own business is very different to being employed. There's a lot of things that you don't think about, you know, taxes, accountancy, hiring people, training people, compliance. So, you know, I kind of went in it with an open mind. And um, a lot of us, I think, don't always understand the amount of work that's involved, um, both on a day to day, but also compliance, HR, making sure you're understanding your plan properly, business plan, scaling plan, um, cost per acquisition. So, uh, to answer your question, you know, I, I definitely undervalued the work that was involved um, and ultimately learned as I went. And I think the key for me was understanding and getting them, finding the people that knew what I didn't and, and, and bringing them guys in as part of my business. One of the things that's come up in, in the conversations we've had before, Kieran, and definitely, um, you know, I think there's a couple of articles that you've got on your site, um, you know, definitely a passionate young business owner. Um, you know, what, 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 what does that mean to you being a young business owner? And do, do you think that also comes with, with limitations? I think people think it comes with limitations. And I think if you listen to the norm or you go online and you talk to people, they believe that it does come with limitations. But, you know, look at some of the most successful people in the world, you know, the Mark Cubans, the Mark Zuckerberg, you know, they started their business very young. And you can't just look at your age. Although in the articles you'll see, I focus heavily on my age because I like talking about it. I like the fact that, I've achieved so much so so young because the norm is, um, and you hear it a lot, you know, don't run before you can walk. And I was taught that a lot when I was young, um, almost telling myself to slow down. And once you get past that and start to understand that age is not a limitation, nor will it hold you back. In essence, it's a power because you're young, you're hungry. Um, I haven't seen any limitations, only the limitations you put on yourself if you believe what you read. Okay. No, great. I mean, look, it's, it's, it's great to be able to share that message with, um, you know, so, you know, our, our audience, you know, young professionals out there, young business owners and, um, you know, great to, uh, uh, to, to hear you, uh, um, you know, walking the walk, uh, on that side of things. Um, so when it came to, um, starting, starting your own business, starting up a business and, um, obviously that business needed to employ people, um, how important is, you know, is good people management, um, as a, you know, in a startup with those first few hires? So I think the, the first key area is understanding your values and the people that you're looking for to align with your business goals is, is step number one. So, um, you know, it's something that I sort of took a step back with. And when you go from sort of one or two people to hiring people and building a business, you have to start looking outside of just yourself and looking at what are your brand values, your personal values, and, and how does that come across in the people that you hire? So you have to go through a bit of that uh, initial phase before you start to kind of push the button on recruitment then you need to look for the type of people. What type of people are you looking for? And really have that aligned with your business goals before you start interviewing people. Because the amount of companies that I've been involved in and I've seen that just go and hire people and then create their values. And then you see a lot of turnover. You see a lot of mistakes made in the hiring process. You need to get your brand alignment first with who you're looking for and what that looks like. Then go out and interview them people with that view in mind, knowing what you're looking for. So um, it certainly changes things, but what it does also change is you eat last is, is basically how it works. You know, your, your employees now come first, whereas when you're a one man, two man band, typically you just have to think about you and your friend. Um, when, when you're hiring people, it's now them and you come last. So it's a whole mindset change and shift ultimately. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, I think that's a, uh, you know, great, uh, you know, great, great, great consideration on, on that side of things. I mean, I guess also, you know, framing that with the sort of work that you do, you know, you're working, you know, very much with, with companies, you're, you're, you're helping them with their, you know, their you know, sales, you know, based consulting, I suppose, you know, it's, it's particularly relevant for, you know, businesses in that area, right? Because there's almost that ultra sensitivity that the people that you've got out going out there, um, you know, representing your brand, you know, um, bringing your customers in, you know, it's, 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 it's ultra important. I suppose that value is clear um, more Absolutely. so than maybe, uh, you know, your average uh, clearly important on, on all members and all levels of staff, but more, more, more so on that, on that side of things. Yeah. It's about understanding how they represent your brand. And especially when you're smaller, it's more evident, you know, when you're a bigger company and you've maybe got one bad hire or one person that doesn't align to your values, it, it can go 
unnoticed in a way and it won't have a massive impact on your business. But when you're a smaller company, especially starting, you want people to associate everybody in your business with your values and your core values. So it's evitable, more important, but also a service-based business, right? You know, we're providing a service rather than a product. So if you're delivering a product, they will also factor in the product, whereas you're service-based, they're looking at the person and the person only. So um, you've really got to be hyper-focused on getting the right people um, and the quality people that you need. So in, in your view, how important is it that the leader of a growing business is a role model and what qualities do you think you know, they would need to demonstrate? Yeah, look, it can be certainly a make or break. You know, I've seen it in, especially in sales teams, MDs, commercial directors, and it's something that I adopted from an early age is you've got to lead from the front. Um, there's a lot of managers that have offices and they buy into this whole, I'm a boss and a title, and they hide away in, a, in an office. And I find them ones that they, they rapidly fail because what you need to understand when you move to a management and a leadership position is everyone's looking at you. There's nowhere for you to hide. Everyone's looking for what you're doing. And if you're asking someone to do something you won't do yourself, then you're automatically in trouble. Um, and for me, you've got to lead from, um, it's, it's imperative for me. Um, up where there was one of the most important things in both sales, but in business in general, because if you look at all of the top leaders, they lead from the front and they're in amongst it and they don't think that anything's below them. You know, I'm happy to jump on the phone. I'm happy to make them phone calls. I'm happy to make people coffee. Uh, I don't care what my job title is. And I think that's so important for businesses to understand. And for you as a, you know, as a leader working with sales leaders, um, how important is it that, you know, the leader is growing as a role model? You know, where do you, um, uh, so from your point of view, where, where do you get your wisdom from? So, you know, if, if you can't get it from, you know, if someone's above you in your workplace that you aspire to be like, then of course you've got your internal mentors in your business. If it's a case of that, you know, that doesn't work for you, then you've got to look externally. And again, this comes back to your values. You've got to find people that align to where you want to go in your values, um, both externally. The great thing about today's society is we're so connected and it's so easy, both from LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, books, audio, guides, um, podcasts. There's so much now that you can do. So my advice there is find someone who's achieved or done what you want to do and then go and follow their journey and learn from them. Um, if you're not a reader, then of course use podcasts. If you're a reader, then utilize the whole book side of things. But also mentors are imperative. You know, someone's got 10 times the experience you have. You can shorten your learning journey down massively. So there'd be the free advice, you know, podcast books and mentors for me. So, I mean, it's a really common theme, actually, you know, across a lot of these conversations we've had and had, a, had about had about mentorship. You know, how, how do you see, you know, that that dynamic and that relationship, um, uh, you know, going? So for someone that might be, uh, you know, in our audience that, that doesn't have someone, how, how would you go about that process and what, what could they look to get from a mentor? Yeah, we'll always look for recommendations. You know, number one, it, you know, talk to people who have had mentors and maybe look at getting a, an introduction there or a recommendation um, but also just go and do research. Don't just jump into anything. Go and do your research and find someone that aligns with what you're looking to achieve. What I would typically do is I would look at people who have achieved what I've wanted to achieve. People who have got knowledge that I don't have. And I'd look at my weaknesses and find the people that have their strengths and then align that mentor with that. Okay, that's interesting. Probably, um, you know, looking at it that way, you definitely get the most value. Um, but normally, you know, maybe you're, you're closer to, you know, um, attract drawn towards someone that probably you know have you have common strengths with um you know so i think that's yeah really good really good bit of advice when looking for uh you know how, how you, who you could be reaching out to and who can give you the most value um mindset's come up a couple of times um i mean were you conscious you know of your mindset when you were you know 16 um has that changed and do you think that role uh, you know the, the role that that's changed if it has changed as as you know has played in your success yeah, it's, it's a question I get asked a lot. I think at a young age, you never think about health and mindset. Very rarely. Um, and I certainly didn't. You know, I was working 18 hours, um, so seven days a week, and I was just go, go, go. And looking back, if there's some advice that I could have given myself to improve would have been spend more time on your mindset and your health to support you in your goals internally. Um, so to answer your question, I certainly didn't focus on mindset back then as much. You know, at school and getting past that GCSEs, I really did. Then I dropped it between the age of kind of 16 and 20. And then, you know, it's kind of the age of 21 where I really started to realize the impact that it can have. And, you know, we've all been there. You, you can do the research online, meditation and taking time for yourself and really understanding how your mindset can impact um, what happens on a day-to-day, -day, but also your goals. And um, 
I've really kind of took myself back and started to learn from, again, coming back to what you said earlier, people online, mentors, people who have been through the journey that I'm going through and want to go through. Um, I'm really spending more time on myself, both in the morning before I start work is a massive thing for me, but also in the evening um, before I go to bed. So mindset's huge, you know, especially in sales. If you're in sales or in any high pressure job, you need to make sure your mindset is on point because the results will show. Yeah, I mean, we, we spoke before, you know, offline about, you know, just really taking time on reflection, your thinking time, you know, how, how I suppose, you know, for yourself running a business, you know, working, you know, at a million miles an hour, um, you know, is that something that, you know, it, it's, it's, is it important that that time's, you know, gone, gone away and you, and you see and you seek that out? Yeah, absolutely. I think we all make excuses and we're all, and myself, you know, included in that to say that we can't do something, whether it be the gym, whether it be meditation, whether it be read a book, I hear it every day, you know, I don't have time. I don't have time. What you really need to do and something that I did is I audited myself and there's kind of a question that stuck with me throughout my whole journey. Someone actually said to me is, um, and it was actually on a podcast I listened to when I was younger. And they said, look, there's, there's a question that you need to ask yourself. Are you interested in achieving that goal or are you committed? Just them two, just them two words, which one? And for me, that stuck with me throughout my whole journey. Because if you are genuinely committed to achieving the goal that you want to achieve, you'll make time. And we all have the same 24 hours. Um, you know, I don't want to go down that whole motivational kind of, we've all got the same 24 hours, X amount of minutes, but it's so true. Um, you will find time to achieve it. And um, if you are committed, you will. So that stuck with me. I've, you know, I get myself up a lot earlier than I used to. And for me, do the hardest thing at the start of the day. If the hardest thing to you is going to the gym, get it done first. If the hardest thing to you is reading, get it done first. If the hardest thing for you is an ab workout, get it done first. It's done. Then you're on to a, onto a winner for the day. Okay. I mean, one of the core cool things that came up and, you know, I suppose just a bit of background for everyone is, I suppose initially, you know, we, we, me and you were talking about your business, you know, we were talking, you know, and, and clearly I think, um, you know, great insight to, to help people get a steer on, uh, you know, sales and, 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 and the suitability towards people. But I think one of those really prevailing underlying things that came up so strongly in those conversations was actually, you know, hard work, you know, and, 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 and I suppose I'd be interested you know, really, Kieran. You know that that means different things to pe- to different people. You know, what what does what what does what does that mean for you? You know, how has that changed? And and over the years, you know, as a as a young professional, you know, the age you are, what you've been doing, you know, there's plenty of people that you know probably you know, you've had to make sacrifices. There's plenty of people that have probably had a very nice time over the last couple of years, and they're potentially you know looking to 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 take the roles that you were taking at, at 17. Yeah, look, I think again, coming back to my my point earlier, it's about being committed. So. To, to answer that question bluntly in a way that there is no substitute, there is nothing that's going to replace hard work. Um, and I hear it time and time again, you know, four hour working week, you know, they talk about having a, a work life balance and, and all this latest kind of uh, phase that they're going through. But actually, you really need to say to yourself, there is no substitute. You look at all the most successful people in the world, they worked hard. And that doesn't mean that you need to work hard for your whole life. That means that you need to set yourself up in a way that you can then start to have more of a work-life balance later on. Now, for me, um, my biggest fear, and it's going to sound controversial, but was getting old and not achieving what I wanted to achieve. And so I was hyper-focused. And coming back to what I said earlier, people said, slow down, stop running before you can walk. And I just surrounded my people that were also hyper-focused on that goal. And unfortunately, whether people like it or not, it comes with, with sacrifices. I went on one holiday, which I just went on in, December in 10 years between the age of 16 and now I went on one holiday I didn't go on lads holidays I didn't go on all kind of the Ibiza the pubs and again it comes back to you've got to say to yourself how badly do you want that goal because given up 10 years in a span of you know the average person lives what 70 to 80 years old is nothing so work ethic there's no substitute and it's it's certainly put me in a place where I am today because you know, I haven't got any magical powers that anyone else hasn't got. It's just been dedication and hard work and um, it will pay off. I think it is a magical power. Well, it can seem like, yeah, I mean, the results can be sometimes, you know, from, from I think, we, we, you know, we made that comment when we were speaking offline. Um, about, about your business at the moment and, you know, more talking about, you know, in the, in the um, you know, the first couple of years, you know, you've talked about, you know, the uh, values and the, and of the business and defining them and finding the right people. But, you know, has, have you found that you've naturally been developing, um, you know, a right hand person or developing, you know, people to be, you know, working closer with you? Is, is, is that, is that a process that's happening in these first couple of years? 
Yeah, so you've got to be really good at um, admitting where your your weak your weaknesses, and and ultimately admitting when you're failing at certain things. I think that's a, a key thing. So many people are scared of that word failure, but you can't be good at everything. You know, I'm not a good marketer, so to speak. Um, you know, I don't know Facebook ads or YouTube ads or how the algorithms work. So I go and find the people. So naturally, when you start off, you try and do everything because one, you want to cut costs, but also two you kind of feel like a superhuman because you own your own company, but you soon learn that actually just focus on what you're good at and the rest will take care of itself. And, and that's what I did. I, you know, my co-founder, Costa Coyze, he's very good operationally um, and very good with client management. And I'm very good at delivering the results that we need to get to, to build them relationships. So that's what we did. You know, we, we sat down and we divided the, the tasks to focus on what we're good at. Now, naturally you will learn new skills as you grow a business and I'm learning every day but I think you need to focus on the task that you're good at and not try and be a jack of all trades. Um, a lot of us are scared and I certainly was because I was like, yeah, but what if I hand it off? It won't be as good as what I want it to be. You've just got to cut that and say, you know what? I need to focus on what I'm good at and start to dedicate and, um, and work with a wider team. So um, to answer your question, yeah, every day you're learning, but my one bit of advice is, is dedicate the stuff that you don't want to do and or very good at and focus on the stuff you are good at. So I suppose just to put it into context, Kieran, because, you know, we, we were speaking about some really, you know, obviously exciting, you know, exciting things, you know, about about your business and, and, and what it is you're doing. I mean, where 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 is your business at the moment? You know, where, where what, what sort of work are you, are you guys doing just to help us sort of work out, you know, what parts of we've spoken about are going to be, you know, going to be relevant to, uh, to, to the audience? Yeah, so in terms of where we are as a business, we, you know, actually have some great news this week. We're named the uh, top sales consulting company in the UK. Um, so we just received that award, which should arrive in two weeks, which is massive for us as a business, considering we started 18 months ago. But we're on massive growth stage. You know, we, we're in our busiest time ever, which is very rare to say in the pandemic. But, um, you know, we generated 10 million last year for our clients. This year, we're on to triple that um, to anywhere from 30 to 40 million. Um, so my job on a day to day is really working with the clients is what we would call interim head of sales, um, but also working with the clients on a day in, day out basis. And then in the evenings, I spend operationally and marketing wise. So I kind of split my time between them two things. So um, again, to my point earlier, it, what's really important is to understand where the money is and the revenue is um, and do that task, which I do between my normal hours. And then in the evening, I spend it on the operational stuff and the marketing stuff, allowing me to bring the revenue in and ultimately get the growth that we want. But um, yeah, in terms of the business, look, we, we've got a lot of ambitious plans going into 2021. And again, it comes back to what I said earlier, we're aligning our values and our goals all the time. Every month, every quarter, um, we're reassessing really where we're at, what's working, what's not, who do we need to bring on? What does that look like? Um, with a focus for me, a big focus for me and any client that you talk to that I work with is value. You know, I want to give as much value to my clients and results as possible. As long as that's coming first, I don't, then we obviously work out the rest. So um, it's really focused on value. So we've had loads of great questions coming from our audience, which is which is great. Um, I think one that's, that's quite interesting is if you were starting again, you know, what a couple of things that you'd be doing that you'd be doing differently. First one is focus on my mindset and health more. Definitely number one because I've suffered since because of it, um, and I think I could have achieved more if I'd have focused on it earlier. So that's my my first tip. Uh, and then second of all, surround yourself from an early as soon as you can with the people that push you, motivate you, um, and ultimately challenge you. Because what I didn't do is surround myself. And there's that old saying, if you're the smartest guy in the room, there's a problem. And I was always the top performer. And I, I always just felt comfortable. It's like, well, I'm the top performer. What, you know, they're not going to fire me. I'm all good. That's what held me back. Um, always push yourself outside your comfort zone. So um, for me, push yourself outside your comfort zone. Um, depending on your age, I, my main goal was move out as soon as possible. Um, and then focus on health and mindset. If you can get your network right, your mindset right, your health right, your career will explode because of it. I mean, is it one, one of the things that we've spoken about on, with, with other people on this, and, and it's interesting how we've spoken about, you know, what advice you'd give back to yourself and also, um, you know, how your attitude to certain things have changed and, and your processes and where they are at the moment. 
I guess the, the 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 discussion point normally is is there ever you know sometimes such thing as a you know as a as a bad decision because sometimes you know you've got to sort of make the mistakes I suppose to give yourself the conviction to 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 point yourself in the in the right direction. I mean, would you would you would you agree with that? Can you can you res can that resonate with you? Yeah, I mean, we no one wants to make a bad decision, right? We're all scared of fear. We've all got that fear in us that we're embarrassed to make bad decisions and we're scared of our reputation. You know, of course, you need to do the research and the, uh, you know, and the analytics behind it before making that decision. So you can obviously mitigate your risk as much as possible. But let's be honest, everybody makes bad decisions. It's a fact. It's a fact of life. And it's how you react to that decision, which will define that failure. Um, I failed many times, whether it be reading and writing, whether it be, um, you know, a month where I've missed target because I got complacent. You know, we all failed and it's the reaction and the self-reflection that's going to make the difference because the, the billionaires out there and the people that probably everyone looks up to in this room have all failed. So, yes, it's inevitable, but it's the reaction that um, will tell the story. So it's interesting because talking about your work with clients and going back to the business, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, you've spoken about, you know, your the business growth you've seen obviously awards that have been won you know you, you you associate you know a number with that um you know but you've also spoken about culturally you know the work that you do with businesses and help them define those values i mean how do you measure you know your your success when you're working with your customers is it is it is it is it, is it a number is it is it is it culture is it relationship added value i mean how you know we've spoken about numbers here but is it ultimately a lot less sometimes tangible than that yeah, a lot of it is less tangible. Um, the main goal for most of my clients, you know, let's be real, is, is increased in revenue or improvement in sales performance. And, and But what comes along with that, it isn't just a, a case of plugging in a script and you're going to make loads of money. It's looking at the whole ecosystem. Now, I'm a big believer of culture, mindset with the staff and how they enjoy coming into work and whether they enjoy their job. So although the end goal might be a number, there is other things that play into that number that people don't necessarily think of things like the culture, the environment, the support network, the investment into your staff. I mean, the thing that shocks me on a daily basis is the lack of support that people give their staff. You know, you come on for a, a two week training or a month training course, and then it's kind of like off you go. Um, so it's about plugging all of them areas into one end goal of achieving the revenue target or the increased in revenue. So it's about educating your clients that it isn't a quick fix, that it is something that we have to look at as a whole package. And one of my clients that I mentioned to you previously, we had a whole new office refit, which has kind of backfired in, in this situation with COVID, but the productivity level within Q1 of this year went up by, I think it was 40% just by changing the environment and the mindset and the investment that we put into them staff. Um, that's massive for me. Number one, um, in terms of getting things right because if your staff enjoy their job um they will stay longer you know we talk about work-life balance but if you've got a nice environment and you're naturally enjoying your job you forget you're at work i think you're on mute pete it wouldn't be a zoom meeting without that happening so thank you very much for your <laughs> <laughs> duration on that Kieran. um so with yourself at the moment i mean how much of, how much of your time is spent you know on the coal phase managing your team your culture obviously your clients culture how do you how, how does that get split yeah look it's 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 always you know there's always challenges splitting your time because there's so much to do but every morning i start with morning huddles so with my own company it'd be half eight I talk about the day, who's achieving what, who's doing what to make sure we're hyper-focused. Then when I take off uh, sort of nine o'clock, when I then transition into working for my clients, I have a 9 a.m. meeting with the whole team, um, whether that be the, the team that I'm managing or the whole operations to make sure that we're all aligned. Um, and then sometimes I'll have a weekly one-to-one -one with them all as well. So I focus a lot of my time on communicating with my staff, but also not over micromanaging them. That's so important because there's a lot of talk about, you know, are people doing what they should be at home? Should people work from home? Should they not? There's so many moving parts in that. For me, if you've hired them, you need to trust them, but also you need to be alongside them to support them. So to answer your question, every morning, half eight um, with my team, nine o'clock with my clients' teams, and then typically at least once a week, a one-to-one -one with each individual to make sure that they know I'm here to support them. And of course, you've got to have that open door policy of whenever you need anything, give me a call drop me an email, whatever you feel most applicable. Um, I think the key is to, to push it on them to make them feel comfortable with outreaching to you. Okay. And something that 
you know, hopefully can resonate um, or, or hopefully you can give a bit of an insight to our audience on. So pass your mind back to, you know, a couple of years ago when you were evaluating whether to effectively that decision to, to, to start the business. Um, you know, potentially, you know, we may have people, you know, and, and we know we have people at the moment that are going through that dilemma. Um, you know, is it just as simple as jump in, you know, and, and the detail work itself out, or is there a bit more of value? How did you go through that process? And whether it's a different question or not, what advice would you give to someone else, uh, you know, that's in those shoes at the moment? So the way I come to this decision was, you know, I'd achieved great success within companies and I had this burning desire to prove that I could do it on my own without the infrastructure without, you know, investment, MDs, operations managers supporting me. Um, but of course it was never a case of just right, wake up in the morning and let's do it. It takes evaluation. You know, you've got to take that time. So what I did is I continued my day job and in the evening started to do the relevant research on what I needed to do before jumping into my business. But not only that, you need to identify what I would call your easy targets to make money. So for me, I was what they would call the king of EPOS. You know, I built two big EPOS companies. I'd done 1.8 million in sales. So I knew that going into my consultancy business, that my number one target was every EPOS company out there to get my business off the ground. So I reduced my risk massively. And then what I started to do was put feeders out there before I quit my job. So I, of course, mitigate your risk as much as possible, find the easy wins and then build momentum off the back of that. Um, of course, uh, business plans and things like that come into play, but also your mentor will come into play. They'll advise you on this. They'll help you with this. And um, yeah, never just jump into it because it's not as easy as people think it is. <laughs> I think that's really sound, you know, really, really good advice. I mean, you know, now you've got, you know, the business up, you know, off the ground, you know, you're starting to get that success. I mean, does it you start to sort of get a feeling and have that evaluation process for new ideas? Do you sort of, you know, sort of starting to get a, uh, you know, potentially a bit of a, uh, you know, uh, a bit of a taste for it? Is, is, is that happening? Are there, you know, other uh, avenues sort of, uh, you know, in, on the horizon? Yeah, I think the key here is to, um, we're all guilty of, and I'm guilty of, is trying to trying to do too much. Um, you know, I was like, right, let's do this, and let's have an event, and let's take on 10 more clients, and let's just blow this up. And um, I've got a tendency for um, having a lot of ideas, but what I would always say is you need to focus on, again, I, you know, I sound like a broken record, but your goals. And if you've got them goals on a, a monthly and quarterly basis, just keep achieving them and knocking them off. So for me, um, one of my big goals was to write my first book. I know I needed to achieve X amount of revenue, X amount of clients before I did that. Um, and that's what we're now doing. So we're now pushing a button and we're just about to sign a deal with the fourth biggest publisher in the world to release that. So, but it's all strategic. A lot of companies do things for ego. You know, a lot of people do things for an ego massage or look at me, I've got all this, the money or buy a, you know, a Ferrari or a Rolex or whatever that be just to kind of pump their chest out and say, look at me, I'm successful. Um, we all have that tendency in us. And for me, I've learned to really focus and, and stay grounded. So, you know, I've kept my focus on that, that book rather than look at me, I'm winning all these awards. Um, let's go out and, and splash the cash. So um, stay focused, keep your goals in mind. But, but to answer your question in terms of where we're going, where I'm writing my first book starting the 24th of this month uh, with a view to release it in April. And then next year we're doing our first ever event, which is going to be in October next year. Okay, great. Well, look, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed, you know, the chat today and I think, you know, we've covered a, you know, a lot of good areas. We, you know, we spoke about offline in preparation for this and I think we've, you know, we've done a really good job of, um, you know, getting some, some, some good advice over to our, our, to our audience. I mean, you know, Kieran, I know, I know, you know, you, you put a lot of content out there in terms of, uh, you know, on sort of on your social media channels on LinkedIn specifically in the market you're doing, how, how do people, uh, you know, how, how do people get in contact? How do people want to, want to, want to keep up with, uh, your business's story and get the update for when the book's released? Yeah, absolutely. So the easiest way is, of course, on LinkedIn. And um, you'll probably see from my name on Zoom, my parents decided to give me the awkward way of spelling Kieran. So it's K-I-E-R-E-N and then O'Connor. And, and like I said, um, anyone wants any advice, anything I can help with, very much an open door policy. Um, uh, as much as I can help, please reach out on LinkedIn directly. Yeah, absolutely. And look, you know, we hope to, uh, you know, to welcome you to, um, uh, to, to an offline, uh, you know, event, uh, you know, sort of towards, uh, uh, hopefully towards the end of the year and, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, getting you in contact with some of our, some of our members for some, uh, you know, for some relevant advice and, uh, you know, and sort of vice versa. But look, you know, I appreciate everyone for, uh, you know, for taking the time to get logged in today. 
um, you know, we will be uh, posting uh, updated, uh, you know, content and videos uh, on the LinkedIn page. Uh, Bitterex is the best way to, uh, to keep an eye on that. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for having, uh, spending the time um, this fine evening uh, on, on, on Zoom. And, uh, you know, Kieran, really thanks for, uh, for your time today. It's been great to, uh, great to share, um, you know, your story and your ideas with the, uh, with the Bitterex community.